This video has been supported by Megatron. Lean back, relax, and open wide for the new CNC dentistry robot. <laughs> While it's working, I'd like to show you how it all started. This cute spindle motor was the first of many CNC parts that I accumulated in 2018. But somehow it didn't grow like the other things. I guess I have to water it some more. For that I didn't want to bother with a proper water cooling loop, so instead I just used a kilometer of silicone tubing. What could possibly go wrong? It's neither a rusty shower for my exposed steel surfaces, nor a melting of the 3D printed holder. I'm pretty sure I've configured this VFD correctly last year. But maybe it forgot. I don't know what happened there precisely, but it caused an internal short in the windings of one phase. I've made a half-hearted attempt to save the thing, but no luck. No drama either. Another spindle candidate is already on the way. And now we can take this one apart, violently. Out of the water cooling sleeve came the AC induction motor rotor. And most importantly, its bearings. The first one on the connector side of the spindle is just a single normal radial ball bearing. And that's okay. On a CNC spindle, however, axial forces can easily exceed radial ones. So just like with our ball screws, a fixed bearing block is needed. At a cursory glance, it looks like it's right here, equipped with a pair of angular contact ball bearings. That would be beautiful, but in reality they have just disguised two more regular, not even deep groove ball bearings. Disappointing and good riddance. I took this brief spindle story and presented it to the experts at Megatron, manufacturer of higher quality spindles. And in response I got a mocking, reproachful box of coolant. Yeah, I guess I deserve it, for destroying that innocent china spindle. But wait, there is more. A customized water chiller to circulate that coolant through something. With their company logo engraved on what must be the most elegant cnc tank cap ever. Thanks Megatron, that is literally very cool. Oh, there's another little box from them, but that's probably just accessories and hoses and stuff. And the usual paperwork. There's also this aluminium holder. Some cute HSK E25 tool holders. And a set of ER16 collet chucks in a suitcase. What a strangely specific set of accessories. It's almost as if they knew what kind of CNC spindle I would try next. No idea how they found out, but here's my new Mechatron ATC80. That's a water-cooled 2.2 kW automatic tool changer spindle. And they also provided a lovingly handmade mixed domain control cabinet for it. By that I mean it acts both in the electronic and in the compressed air domain. It's all plug and play, ready to go. But that has never kept me from taking a closer look at everything. Let's start here. V1 is just a mains filter that prevents high-frequency interference from leaving the box. The VFD is a good Omron MX2 with field-oriented control, meaning that it doesn't just play back pre-recorded waveforms, but actually takes rotor position into account when delivering phase current. It won't deliver anything though, unless the red safety relay gives it the all-clear. It's meant to be configured in an all-encompassing safety circuit that only allows machine operation 
when neither water chiller nor servo drives are in an error state, when no emergency stop buttons are pressed, and when the operator has passed a breathalyzer test. The pneumatics on the right are one input filter regulator and three or four switchable outputs. The blue lines, in the complete disregard for good layout and mounting practices, show where I have contributed something to this system. I wanted another switchable air output for mist cooling. That will be by far the biggest compressed air consumer with dozens of liters per minute. For that the air doesn't need to be particularly clean, so I'm just going to take it from the input directly without unnecessarily polluting the nice Festo filter regulator. To find out where exactly the three original air outputs are going, I'm afraid we have to perform another violent spindle teardown. This beauty is going to be a challenge though. Being all full of preloaded and precisely torqued precision parts and sensors. These connectors alone are absolutely stunning. Oh well, let's not delay. Time for the first high-end spindle teardown on YouTube. I've already prepared the usual high-end spindle teardown tools for the occasion. But in the very last moment I got an email from the manufacturer with this incredible 3D sectional drawing. That way we can do it all virtually and safely without damaging the goods. Boring. At the top there is a series of pneumatic ejecting cylinders. They are reset and held in position by these spiral springs. When the cylinders are pressurized the springs are overpowered and the central rod is pushed downwards. Down there there's an HSK E25 clamping system that looks similar to this one. Its teeth grab tool holders from within. So when the thing starts spinning, a growing centrifugal force is added to the normal spring-loaded clamping force. That makes HSK clamping the hottest thing right now. Not only, but especially for high RPM spindles. Hopefully not hot, real angular contact ball bearings. With a maximum 42,000 RPM for which this spindle is rated, these guys have to be special. Special and clean. There's a labyrinth seal between rotor and stator, through which a small amount of compressed air is constantly flowing. That way no dust particles can enter. The motor is an AC induction machine. Its stator is turned, ground and pressed into the water cooling sleeve. Before that it looks similar to this. Last but not least we've got a couple of sensors which detect rotation and the state of the clamping system. That will be very important when we are making an automatic tool changer for the thing. For now though I'll just focus on the installation. This all round carefree spindle package has been delivered, set up and ready to go. So all that's left to do for me is some machine alignment and tramming. The x-axis has to be parallel to the clamping plate and the spindle has to be perpendicular to it. Sounds pretty easy, right? Well, on a micrometer level nothing is. The spindle shaft temperature can make it grow and shrink sufficiently to make a difference. The final quarter turn of an already snug screw can ruin an alignment completely. I've modified the beautiful spindle holder slightly, but then screwed it down onto one of its own chips. Huge impact in the micrometer department. Time for the maiden flight. This is the rocket launch like starting procedure. That makes sure that all subsystems are ready and we don't end up exploding during ascent. I thought I had already worked pretty hard on this whole tramming thing and wanted to put it to the test. By slowly facing this aluminium piece and looking at the resulting surface finish. Well, here's what came out. It's reasonably flat I guess, but the spindle is not yet perpendicular. Not one bit. The entire gantry had a slight forward nod. 
Not quite as dramatic, but you get the idea. Now the easy thing to do would have been to shim the motor holder and to compensate for the nod that way. But who would choose the lame easy way, if instead you can wrangle back and forth a few hundred kilograms of steel for a day or two? I did that, until I measured four to six microns back to front. With a fully extended lever gauge. With a smaller diameter tool, the deviation will be even smaller of course. Afterwards, I did the same thing side to side. I haven't reached perfection yet, but I'm better than the parallels and the precision vise that I have available at the moment. So I don't think it would make a lot of sense to go any further right now. Although I've got a pretty strong urge to do so, not gonna lie. Throughout this lengthy process, I somehow managed to maintain x-axis parallelity as well. And I think my machine will be able to maintain all of these adjustments in almost all situations too. For example, I don't expect normal cutting forces to ever exceed the 25 kilogram which I'm pulling here. So the only sources for higher gantry deflection are machine inertia in abrupt movements, resonant vibrations and accidents. But I'm not planning to have any of those, so we should stay within a single digit number of microns, usually. That's about the diameter of a red blood cell, so I'm happy with that, for now. Let me just redo the surface finish test real quick. After this epic effort, it better be good. These are also some very conservative feed and speed parameters. And the tool, a two-flute solid carbide end mill, is almost new. What's not working in surface finishes favor here is the back and forth lawnmower mode. It'll leave the usual CNC tool marks and make things look a little less perfect than they actually are. And you know what? They actually are pretty damn good now. You can partially see the previous lines of tool marks through the step over. And a brief touch with a flat stone reaches the entire surface. I couldn't think of any better method for showing surface roughness than this, other than buying a surface roughness meter. But let's finally start making some productive chips. Brrr. After the 35 degree C summer, it's getting really cold in here now. I'm machining an acrylic light guide for a photodiode. The shape is deceptively simple. Two parallel concentric squares, one of them a bit smaller. To make them super flat, I'd like to machine the sides only with the side of the milling bit. That works beautifully for the first three sides. It makes a terrible mess though, just like everything else I'm going to do on this machine, I'm afraid. Then near the end, the part kind of hangs from its last thread and breaks off in a not very clean way. The result is mostly beautiful, which is not a big deal with an easy material like acrylic. Better work holding and a finishing end mill would have improved it even more. Next, similarly bad work holding and only marginally more difficult material, aluminium. I'm trimming down a stack of these sheet metal U-profiles, which will become telescopic way covers. With everything still being new, I'm not moving particularly fast yet, but I am removing quite a pile of material here. Not really a spindle related topic, but if there's enough interest, I can make a separate video about these. Let's do more and faster. This is going to be an adapter to connect a hand wheel to an old welding transformer. Unfortunately, this random piece of stock material with a beautiful surface finish is way too big. So we've got a lot of material to pulverize. Doing that with a precision high-frequency spindle is like going to the dentist for a pedicure. It's technically possible, but not really meant for that. 
With a 9mm two-flute solid carbide end mill at 15,000 RPM, 10mm depth of cut and 1,000mm per minute feed, this is how much aluminium we can shred. 0mm, pretty easy. 0.1 mm, a good value for a clean finishing pass. 0.2 mm. 0.5 mm. Please stop judging my servo window cutout. 0.75 mm and that 3D printed bearing block is also pretty gnarly, isn't it? 1 mm. Let's machine a new one later. 1 and a half mm. Two millimeter. I should probably calculate and adjust my parameters for optimal chip load in each test, but I'm not even sure how relevant these tests are for the automatically generated adaptive toolpaths that I'm going to run on this thing. Three millimeter starting to chatter a bit. Now I could add more flutes or more than double the RPM to make this easier. But realistically I don't think I will ever need such heavy cuts. Not exactly steaming hot A-bomb 79 size chips, but still fantastic. I don't have the right tool for that central hole I'm afraid. A normal hardware store twist drill certainly is not it. It would be comfortable around 1 to 3000 RPM while the spindle has most of its power at 10 times that speed. Still with extra slow manual jogging we are getting through and that's okay for a one-off low-tech part. Did I hear adaptive toolpaths? Let's make one more aluminium part, but microscopic this time. With microscopic tools, high RPMs and high-tech optimal load toolpaths. I have no experience with this whatsoever, so there will be some microscopic casualties I'm afraid. That final tap was game winning, check this out. I want to try and use these solid tungsten carbide PCB bits. They may not have the perfect geometry for metalworking, but they are cheap in large quantities and they break easily when something is going wrong. So my lack of experience doesn't pose a threat to that fancy spindle. In Fusion 360's CAM I've configured no less than 5 operations to make this part. First, 3D adaptive clearing to remove a lot of material quickly, but with 0.2mm stock to leave for a later finishing pass. This will utilize the entire 9mm length of the flutes, with their 2mm diameter that's certainly pushing the envelope a little bit. Next, another 2D adaptive that spirals out a bit further than the part's actual silhouette, as a preparation for the 2D contour cutout. Then, while I still have a good grip on everything, I'm finishing this internal surface by removing the last 0.2mm. Doing roughing and finishing with the same tool is not a very good idea at all, but you know, this is all still very experimental. Then I'm going to try and cut out the part with a 2D contour operation. That is not a modern smart strategy, but a traditional lateral slot milling. And then finally I'm going to pack drill that central hole with a 200 micrometer drill bit and hopefully not end up having to watch it bend. Okay, here goes nothing. The entry helix is way too slow. And the optimal chip load setting is way too aggressive. 
rip my first tool ever on this machine. Okay, better. Whoa, 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 calm down, dude. Oh, that still feels like way too much material for such a tiny end mill. But in general, the utilization of the entire tool length that one of Mechatron's experts has recommended to me works really well. For better chip evacuation, I've got to avoid these narrow, deep holes, though. Oops. What was perfectly obvious, but completely under my radar until now, is the kind of chips that a small tool with a high RPM spindle produces. In collaboration with a mist cooling fluid, this fine aluminium powder likes to stick everywhere, and well enough to not just be vacuumed away. It's really unpleasant actually, and it makes me want flood cooling, even though that would be incompatible with my oil lubrication and just needing a lot more work in general. Here's what I originally wanted to be a finishing pass. I generated that with a relatively new steep and shallow strategy in Fusion 360, and as it turns out, it does more work than I would like a gentle finishing pass to do. It makes the first breakthroughs in these spokes even, and then kind of hastily cleans them up. That's not a catastrophe though, and the next time I'll know more. And now the sound of 30,000 RPM for that 200 micrometer drill bit. Oh yeah. It feels almost as if I've got to be careful with the mist cooling. Too much pressure and we'll send that dainty tool flying. No, not really. This turned out to be the easiest operation in the end. Half a millimeter per pack with full retraction. And I didn't break a single one of these bits. This kind of micro-machining really benefits from Mechatron's world-class run-out specification of less than 2 microns for this model. Otherwise, such a tiny drill's shelf life is about the time it takes to travel from tool changer to material. But here we just made a 4 mm deep hole without a problem. Alright, how and especially what did we do? Is this some kind of bling alloy wheel for a 200 micrometer axle? No, it's a fiber lapping puck. In a long ago fiber coupled laser video, I tried to polish a termination handheld. That resulted in rounded corners and subsequently a burning termination. This thing will hold fibers perfectly square while lapping. And that'll hopefully result in much better terminations and a few more fiber laser adventures. Okay, that's no fun anymore. This finger-numbing cold doesn't deserve happy Christmas tunes either. There's actually another conceptual problem that I haven't thought about before moving here. We haven't even reached sub-zero temperatures, but my oil viscosity is already honey, and the central lubrication pump is stalling. Let's work really hard to warm up this shed. Time for some steel. I'll keep my phone in a somewhat safe distance here, so that I can at least document the aftermath, if things go horribly wrong. This is the same sharp, two-flute solid carbide end mill. Theoretically, with its geometry it can plunge and cut full slots to a certain degree. So some superficial scratching on this piece of carbon steel should be alright, I hope. We're not really cutting steel here, but mostly that delicious brown crust. With my old aluminium CNC I couldn't even think about brown crusts without it losing steps. So this is already quite the accomplishment, but after working on this thing for a year, I'm expecting a little bit more. Hold on to your hats, I'm taking an entire millimeter now. Wow, so quiet and effortlessly, fantastic. For me, and those rare steel occasions, that would already be good enough. But for the sake of flexing, I think we've got a lot more potential. 
Although flexing is kind of the opposite of what we want here. Yeah, 1.5 mm depth is still easy, but it doesn't sound as nicely anymore. Oh no, the chips are even nastier. They embed themselves into whatever you're wearing, or skin if nothing else is available. Not that I've conducted such an experiment, mind you. It's still way too few degrees C in here. But the beauty of a freshly milled piece of steel is worth it, so I'll endure the chips today. And for the next four days as well. And whenever I want to wear this sweatshirt again. I can even run such a spiral plunge right into the material, with reasonable parameters. But I had to pull the emergency brake there, that sounded terrifying. I bet the neighbors in a 500 meter radius will agree. That was the second appearance of the overly enthusiastic default values in Fusion 360. Let me try again over here with 1mm optimal load instead of 2.8. Wow, look at that. Grown up CNC performance right there. This is such a big moment. I kind of knew that my machine frame was pretty strong, but pretty strong was more or less all the data I had. I never simulated anything, so seeing this steel shredding performance is a huge relief. It's almost fireworks worthy, don't you think? Oh look, we are getting happy colorful chips now. Temperatures must be rising. Hey, um, would you mind not doing that, please? What the hell was that? Did they put stone in their steel? There isn't even anything out of the ordinary down there. Maybe my mist cooling didn't reach all the way into the bore. Or it was the revenge of the infamous brown crust and whatever case hardening happens to go along with that. At any rate, the conclusion that I'm going to draw here is exactly the one that I was hoping for. The dream team that is my CNC machine and the Makatron spindle can take on steel without slowing down too much. By doing so we can create beautiful surface finishes however, and almost perfect geometric accuracy. Almost. I wanted to finish this video by making my own bearing blocks, ideally with the same fit as this one, but somehow my solid carbide end mill got dull all of a sudden. So before mauling this beautiful piece of pre-ground steel, I've got to get that sorted. Overall, this spindle is an absolute highlight, and utilizing its tool changer will keep me busy for a little longer. If your CNC machine needs an upgrade as well, Check out the manufacturer Mekatron, who has high quality spindles in all price and power ranges. In their standard line they have liquid and air cooled models, this one being one of the latter. None of them have fake bearings or blackout causing defects like the other one that I've taken apart in the beginning of this video did. But they are still reasonably priced for hobby machines and specified for more than that. They also have these tool change adapters, with which you can transform another spindle and give yourself a huge productivity boost. Running multi-tool programs autonomously, no longer having to measure offsets and so forth. I'm also working towards that, but for now one last silly experiment. This blue bit is just as mean as it looks. It's a six flute solid carbide hard milling tool. So let's see if we can take a bite out of that tough machine tap. Oh, of course we can. I think when working slowly enough we can take small bites out of everything.
even completely innocent ER-32 chucks. Alright, I think that was enough destruction for today. Thank you for watching and see you soon.